Um, can you hear me now online? Yes, no, yes, yes, I guess. We were just uh, looking at uh, the results from assignment one, and I just said about assignment two uh, that I will give you additional time to work on it, and if you have questions, feel free to ask. And I have been asked uh, here to, if we can plot velocity as arrows instead of colors, the answer is yes. And usually you use a glyph, which is up there in part of you. What was that? Um, you apply. After a long time, usually you see things. Ooh, that was ugly. Well, you have to work on it. I will find a solution to this. Keep doing exercise. <laughs> um, I guess you oh, yeah, it's because you have to decide which parameter. So you have to decide which vector to use, and we want to use u, the velocity. And after a while, give me a sec. Scalar race. velocità. Why it's doing it like that? Oh yeah, now you can. It's, uh, you have to select a glyph and then you have to set that the orientation array is based on velocity and the scale array is based on velocity. Now you have a lot of arrows, you can reduce them. Now we have 5,000 points, I think you can do 1,000. and you can remove these and only see the arrows. Then you can play around with the size of the arrows, with the color of the arrows, you can do many things. But this is not really open form related, this is part of you related. It's just, and oh, typically in part of you, you can find quite a bit of documentation online on so how to use part of you. And it's the same if you're using part of you for open form or for any other tool. You're welcome.
Sorry.
For those that are online, I've been asked why there are two default fluxes. The reason is that when you need to do SP3 instead of diffusion, you need to provide initial and boundary condition for the flux and for the first moment of the flux, for the second moment of the flux. So in your case, you're doing diffusion, you can forget about the second default flux.
Is there anyone that has finished? Pervini? Yeah? What's the key effect you obtain? Group, is there anyone from group one? What's the key effective? Huh? Sure. Group two, anyone? 1.4? 4? Raise your voice. 1.4? 4? 6? This is a key effective. Uh, don't be shy with number. 1.406, give me another two. Six. Six. Another one? Oh. Let's get to PCM at least. Five, okay. And this is for a zero gradient or for a fixed value? Because you should have a fixed value and a zero gradient boundary condition. So zero gradient. And do you also have results for the fixed value? Yes. Okay. Is that the same thing for everyone? Group one? Say again? Value? How much? It's the same. Okay. Group three? Zero point five, there's a problem. Zero point? Zero point four three nine. Give me another number. Uh, group four? Interesting. It's gonna be interesting to figure out what changed because no, the funny thing is that yesterday I obtained both and I don't know why, but we'll try to figure out why. So in the morning yesterday I obtained one and in the afternoon the other. And I think it's a matter of which temperature we are solving it at, but let's see, let's try to do it together. So, um, I'll tell you what I would do. Uh, hopefully, I will remember to do all of it. It would be nice. So, um, let me get the folders. So, if you d get a wrong number, don't be worried. Sometimes it can be that you forget to set a little parameter. And, uh, no, Genform is big. Sometimes you need time to go through all of it and make sure that everything is correct. I said even myself yesterday did it and I obtained two different K effective and I think it was because at some point I forgot to set a temperature somewhere. Anyway, so what I would do is, um, what, I, what I already did while waiting, I copy pasted the case into a starting case two, just to not to lose what I did before. Um, so this is what we had from exercise one and as I said, we have a lot of inputs that are given in the input folder. And I said that there are nuclear data and there is a mesh, and you need both. And you need both where? Well, in the, neutron, in the neutral region. So you go into constant, you go into neutral region, you have a poly mesh, you want to change it into the new poly mesh. Can you leave it like this? No, you need to change the name. It has to be called a poly mesh. So we call it poly mesh. Then we have all the nuclear data that were in there that we don't like because they were kind of dummy files with no content or very little content, and we want those that I gave you. That includes real cross-section data. Put it in there. As I said, the idea is let's take a look. It's gonna be small, but I will do it anyway because you can open it on your computer. You look into it, you will see things like energy group six, precursor groups eight. So we are solving for six energy groups, eight precursor groups, and we have different cross-sections for the heat exchanger, intermediate circuit, main, etc. And you will see that the cross sections are, each one of them is into six groups, yes. 
it is there for a later exercise. It's not, no, not at all. No, in, in open form you can throw in random files, it will simply not read them. And I ask you to check parameterization and nuclear data axial expansion. You look at it and there's nothing. Well, of course, because we don't have um, cross sections for axial expansion. This is for fast reactor, for solid fuel fast reactor. There's nothing in there. So we don't parameterize for that. Uh, what about the cool? Nothing, because our coolant is the fuel. What about uh, fuel temperature? There you have something. If you look at it, you will see that the cross-sections are slightly different than those in nuclear data. These are cross-sections that are valid for a different temperature. This is how we parameterize the cross-section. We give one cross-section set at a nominal temperature, one cross-section step at a perturbed temperature, and we do an interpolation. So we are parameterizing our cross-section based on the temperature of our uh, fuel, coolant. We call it fuel here because it's a molten salt reactor. So what's in there that we may need to change? So we have our nuclear data, we have them parameterized, we have control rod movement. I haven't mentioned control rods, so we don't touch it. We have the mesh. What about neutronic properties? Again, it's a bit small, uh, but it's already diffusion. We are happy. We keep it. We want it to have a diffusion. But it says eigenvalue false. We want it true. It was in the assignment. We want an eigenvalue solution. So we set eigenvalue neutronics to true. So now we look into this and we realize we have touched everything we wanted to touch. So we forget about constant, hopefully. I did everything. Um, we don't touch fluid. We don't touch thermomechanic because we are doing just neutronics. And then we look into system. And uh, of course, we will have to touch the control dict. Um, we do it now. Uh, it's small, so let me do it uh, because this is important. I want to do it in a way that you see what we do. So we go to our starting case two. And we look at uh, system control dict. And you look at it, uh, as usual, you have a start time. It's okay, we start from zero. You have an end time. And uh, we don't care about the time. As I said before, these are false time steps. We want to simply iterate. And I said we would like to have approximately 100 iterations. So if our start time is zero and our end time is 10, what's the delta t to get to 100 iterations? 0 0.1, right? 0 0.1 time steps, we do it 100 times, we will get to 10 seconds. Because this is the way we iterate 100 times in open form. Something we don't really care about. Um, standard open form things. What do we want to solve for? I said we want to solve only for neutronics. So no fluid mechanics, no energy. Solve neutronics, true. Solve thermomechanics, false. Liquid fuel stays as it was, it is true. Just time step, do we need it? No, we are not doing thermal hydraulics. We don't want to adjust, we just want to run 100 iterations. So we want our time step to stay 0 0.1 and get to 10 in 100 iterations. This is how we set iterations. We use a fake time stepping. What happens if you leave adjust time step to false? Well, it will try to adjust your time step based on current number and it is not calculating the current number. So you may run into some problem. Um, the rest, we don't care. We have questions about this control dict. Does this time st fake time stepping make sense to you? Not really, maybe a little bit. We want to iterate 100 times. 
we do 100 times step of 0.1 that will not enter anyway, but just force OpenFOAM to do 100 solutions. We will be in a loop. It will start, okay, I solve one. Am I at the end? No, I need to solve once again, once again, once again for 100 times. That's how we create iteration. And since we are solving for eigenvalue, the DDT, the derivative over time, has been taken off. So we don't really care if our time step is 0 0.1, 1, 10, as far as we do it 100 times. It's tricky. This is a very open, foamish way of doing things. Because open foam was born for CFD and you always have time somehow. So we do it this way. What else am I missing? Oh, I said that we need to um, set the power to 20 megawatts. And I said that this thing is inside the reactor state. How do I find reactor state? You can locate, you can grab, you can think where it could be. You can imagine that reactor state may change over time, right? So the most logical place for it to be is in the time folders. So you get to, not here. So you get into your time folder from zero could be in neutral region, it's not. And I'm sorry about that, this is again a way we have in open form. Uh, because in these folders we typically have fields. A reactor state has a K effective and uh, power, it's not a field. We keep those things in something called uniform. And in there there is something called reactor state. If you cannot find it, you grab it, you locate it, or Best thing, when you are alone at home and you want to do this thing, before doing anything, you look at everything that there is inside your folder. You want to familiarize with every file that is in there. And while doing that, you will bump into something called reactor state that has a power and a K effect. We said that our target power is 20 meg. Or you look at the documentation. If you have, you know, two, three hours, read the documentation, these things are explained. Um, so we have our... 20 megawatts is to the seven, right? <laughs> we said we want two megawatts. So, well, not of zeros for not much. Two to the seven watts. This is 20 megawatts. What about K effective? Well, K effective is what we want to find. Does it make sense to give a K effective in there at the beginning? Kinda, this is the initial condition. It is, you know, when you set a new field, you set an initial condition. You also should do it for K effective. It's the initial guess that you provide. It will not change much, but it's going to make your computation faster. So another thing that we need. Initial and boundary conditions. Many of you notice that there are default flux and the default flux two. Default flux two, it is, is for SP3 simulations. You don't need it. Uh, default flux, let me open it from the terminal. System zero. Now, what you had here was clearly wrong. We were giving a fixed value to everything. And, uh, well, it's not completely wrong. There are at least two things that were wrong, which is the boundary conditions for the wedges. So we are doing 2D, uh, and you need your front and back to be treated as wedges. I don't remember the name of the front and back. Front and back. Front and back. Okay. So what you need to do was to create two things that are called, well, I can actually do it the right way, front, front.
type badge. Oh yeah, sorry. Right? Double check. Why? Uh, I think it's the first one it finds. I'm all relatively sure. That it's the opposite? You sure? Okay, we'll try. Here the question is, you may wonder why we are discussing, is because this thing it says all fields equal to fixed value. And we are wondering, we don't remember if OpenFOAM gets the first one that it finds or the last one. So if it says, okay, I found something called front, I use it, or I found something called front and then I something, something else that tells me all the fields equal to fixed value. Second case is wrong, first case is right. We'll try it. If it gives us a mistake, we'll change it. For the moment we have front, back, wedge, wedge. You understand why this wedge thing, right? We have our front and back that are kind of symmet strange symmetry conditions. And this strange symmetry in open form is treated using a ba specific boundary condition that has a name. And the name of this boundary condition is wedge. Same as Monday. And this standard, it's not gen form, this is open form. Right? Finger crossed, this is correct. Am I missing something? Let's try. Uh, we go up to the root of our folder and we try to run gen form. At the beginning, you always see this mesh-to-mesh uh, -mesh addressing that takes a while. Do you understand what OpenFOAM GenFOAM is doing? We have, and now we have two different meshes. Even though Fluid Dynamics is not used, we gave GenFOAM a mesh for fluids and a mesh for neutronics. And since it has to transfer fields between the two at the beginning, it does a mesh-to-mesh -mesh projection and creates an addressing to be able to project fields from one mesh to the other. And projection field from one mesh to the other is a complicated thing, and it takes a while for OpenFOAM to do it. It worked, so it was not wrong, Alessandro. Seems it worked. Um, Okay. That's interesting. I'm curious now. Let's let's try. So you said that if we change the control dict to liquid fuel false, which I don't find it, liquid fuel false. Can I rerun it? I should get a 1.2 something, right? Faster than thermal hydraulics, huh? I, 
that didn't kick you in. Yeah. Yeah, you gave me food for toast while I give you the next exercise. Uh, let's change it back to what it was, and then I will think about what happened here. Um, I just wanted to show you some results. So let's run it again. I think I know what happened, I will tell you. Um, so someone online asked me how to do, to visualize with Paraview in case Paraform doesn't work. I told some of you. So what you do is you create a file that you can call whatever you want, case.form, just an empty file, and then you do Paraview. You wait WSL to do its things. Long time, apparently. Then you open a case, you search for your case.form, and it will open. Simple as that. So we have our case, we go to the last time steps that we hope it was enough to converge the solution. And you look at things, you can look at fluxes for different um, energy groups. Does this make sense to you as a flux? In the center it goes to zero. This was the um, fixed value Dirichlet boundary condition. So it was fixed value, zero. Have you tried to look at what happened if you gave zero gradient everywhere? So if you give zero gradient everywhere, your flux will be flat. Because there is no reason for the flux to diminish towards the boundary. You will see a flat flux. And why do you have a higher K effective? Because you have no leakages. Higher, no leakages, your K effective will increase. Do you remember the six factor, factor formula? Last two factor in the six factor, factor formula are leakages. Thermal and fast. And if you remove leakages with a zero gradient, your K effective will increase, right? Which will be actually equal to the K infinity. Exactly. So when you do, uh, it's actually. When you have a geometry like this, giving zero gradient everywhere is actually a good way to check that your k infinity is what you expect. Because often when you get cross-section data, the tool that gives you the cross-section data will also give you the k infinity. Typically Serpent does that, I assume OpenMC does that, no? Good. Uh, it's, it's a good check, so it, like in Serpent they typically give you the k infinity then you give the cross-sections to GenFOM and you check that K-infinity is the same. That way you make sure that you, your transfer of cross-sections from Monte Carlo to deterministic was correct. Um, well, the other fluxes are very similar, actually, so it doesn't change much. If you go to flux 5, it's pretty much the same. Uh, what happens if you look at precursors? 
they look always the same. They, of course, the scale is different, but why? Well, because we didn't move our fuel now. We did just a single neutronic solution. So there is no moving fluid. Our precursors are sitting there, and you have higher pre precursor where you have higher fluids, and that's it. <coughs> Things will change in the next assignment. As next assignment, we want to try to put together fluid dynamics, neutronics, and get our first multi-physics simulation. Um, before we move forward, um, do we have questions about this exercise? All right, uh, then I will answer a question that I got online um, some time ago. I've been asked if you can do both porous medium and heterogeneous geometry in gen form. The answer was no till a month ago, and now it's yes and no, meaning we are working on that. Uh, it's probably going to be ready in a couple of months. Uh, we should be able to do heter heterogeneous fuel and homogeneous fuel uh, depending on what you prefer to do, without even an option. It will automatically recognize if you are doing homogeneous or heterogeneous. So for the personal line of, who asked, uh, if you can be patient in a couple of months, we will be there. For the moment, when you do fuel, uh, we mainly do porous medium. Um, that's how Genform was born, but we are modifying it to be a bit more flexible. Um, Am I missing something, Stefan? I can go to... Many things. That's why I thought uh, we need, I need to think what happened there. <coughs> Liquid fuel impacts a lot of different things. It impacts the fact that you move around the precursors or not. It impacts the fact that you provide the power directly to the liquid instead of giving it to a structure and then to a liquid. <coughs> and there's at least another, which I believe is the reason why you can get different results, is that it decides whether to use the temperature of the coolant to parameterize nuclear data T fuel or fuel temperature. As you remember, we gave different cross section set for nuclear data and nuclear data fuel temperature. It means we are trying to parameterize based on temperature of the fuel. If you have a solid fuel reactor, the temperature of the fuel is what comes from the power model fuel pin. If you have a molten salt reactor, the temperature of the fuel is actually the T of the fluid dynamic solver. So you have to use that switch to decide how you are parameterizing. And I believe what happened there is that Genfoam, when you say false, is go, is try to go and read, instead of the temperature of the coolant, the temperature of a fuel that is not there and that is set automatically to zero. So you are essentially parameterizing your cross-section based on a temperature that was never calculated. Does that make sense? It's not easy. But you can see how, you know, fuel has two different meanings for a fluid react, fluid fuel reactor and a solid fuel reactor. And that switch has implications. And one of the implications is parameterization. And I think for those of you who set liquid fuel to false, Genfoam was trying to parameterize the cross-section based on a fuel temperature that has never been calculated and that is set to zero. That would explain why you got a much higher K-effective because the parameterization of cross-section makes it for a higher reactivity for lower temperature because we have a negative feedback. So if all of a sudden open foam, gen foam was reading or was using a temperature of zero because it was never calculated, you would get much higher uh, K-effective. Oh, this is my Let's call it educated guess about what's happening. But I should double check. 
Does that make sense? Thirty thousand PCM. It's a lot, and it may only come from a completely wrong parameterization of cross section. So always be careful. If there is a flag that tells you liquid fuel and you have a liquid fuel, set it to true. All right. I would suggest, since we are very late, as expected, I would suggest that we move to the third exercise. That is. Uh, a bit more interesting. This time we try to solve the two things together. So, let me show it to you. So the idea here is, let's see if the velocity field has an impact on neutronics. Um, for that, we need a couple solutions. We need uh, fluid dynamics plus neutronics. Since we don't want to run a transient, we can keep doing eigenvalue. May seem strange, but eigenvalue solver will not care. If you change its underlying precursors distribution, the eigenvalue solver will adapt. So it will keep being an eigenvalue solver. So what we want to do now is we start from what we had and from the previous two exercises. And I would suggest to start from exercise two because it now includes both exercise one and two. That's why I told you, please copy paste exercise one to two the second. So now you should have a case where you have both meshes, you have neutronics that has been set, you have fluid dynamics that has been set, you have everything. You start from there and you try to run a case with coupled uh, solution and fluid dynamics. Um, and I would like you to try to plot the results, see how the precursor distribution change, and see how the k-effective changes. This is going to be interesting. It's going to change. And I have, as usual, some uh, tips on how to do the exercise. Think about what's changing physically for neutronics. Is there something that we need to solve for now that we were not solving for before? Maybe. There's something that is starting to move around. And if you want to solve for that something moving around, you will need initial and boundary conditions. You will need a new field that you will have to introduce in zero. Because otherwise, yeah, it will simply tell you I cannot find it. You can try it. Um, this is a tricky one, so I have to give you a hint. Sometimes when you use this kind of solvers, you will run into numerical troubles. You will add the sphere physics, and all of a sudden it doesn't converge too well. And that's the moment where you look at things like FIV solution and FIV schemes. And when you look at FIV schemes, as Stefano mentioned to you on Monday, most of the time the problem comes from the divergence. It's the tricky part to solve. And you can choose different schemes. There is one that is always bounded, meaning it doesn't give strange oscillatory behavior. Um, it's first order, so it's not super accurate, but it's stable. It's the upwind scheme. Think about it. You will need to use it. And the last hint that I give you is you can start as we did before. You start from zero. Uh, your initial condition is going to be zero velocity, zero pressure. Is it a good starting point, or can we start from something better since we already have solutions for velocity? I'm already telling you, yeah, you should use the velocity solution. How to do that? You can think about it. Is the assignment and suggestion, so are the assign assignment and suggestions clear enough? You have questions? 
Otherwise, I will let you have fun. And as usual, we are here. If you have questions, you call us. Uh, if you have doubts that you think are of interest for the whole group, you let us know and we we'll answer to the whole group. Okay? So I go back to the assignment. And anyway, you should have the PDF so you can keep also the suggestions with you. Check what I said. This should be a bit shorter than the one we did before, so hopefully we can do it before we have to go to the discussion session. Oh, we have the coffee break now? Now, now, now? No, no. Okay. So think about this for two minutes, <laughs> and then we go to the coffee break. Partono da 10, ma se partono da 1 o da 0. Non è obbligatorio precarso, viene un tempo.
for those that are online, we are taking a break. We'll be back in 10-15 minutes.